welcome to America's Test Kitchen at Home. Today I'm making an easy but elegant Moroccan fish tagine. Jack's gonna tell us all about buying and storing spices, and Becky's making an ultra creamy hummus. We've got a lot in store today, so stick around. To me, cod is like the boneless, skinless chicken of the sea because it has a mild flavor that really benefits from a recipe that packs a punch. A lot like a Moroccan fish tagine, which is what I'm gonna show you how to make today. Now, I like serving tagine with a little bit of rice in the bottom of the bowl to catch that sauce. So I have some basmati cooking in the rice cooker back there. And the other thing about a tagine is there's one key ingredient that you have to include, and that's preserved lemons. Now you can buy preserved lemons at a nice, well-stocked market. You can make them, although it takes a few weeks for them to marinate and ferment. Or you can use this really quick recipe I'm about to show you. It takes only 24 hours for the lemons to really soften, and they can hold for up to two weeks. All right, so here I have two lemons, and I already washed them. Washing the lemons is crucial because you're gonna use the skins as well, so you want them to be nice and clean. And I'm gonna trim off the edge here. I'm gonna use a mandolin to slice them as thinly as possible. Now really, you can't slice them thinly enough by hand. Just gonna slice these nice and thin. They're gonna start to break apart, and that's okay. And watch your fingers. All right, here I have all these lemon slices. To this, we're gonna add three tablespoons of sugar. Now, sugar is not a traditional ingredient in preserved lemons, but in quick preserved lemons, it really helps mitigate that acidity. We're gonna add some salt, three tablespoons of table salt. And last but not least, some olive oil. Now, olive oil is also not traditional, but that oil will help soften the skins overnight. So that was three quarters of a cup of extra virgin olive oil. Stir this around, get it really nicely combined. So I'm just gonna take the lemons and pack them into the jar. Now we do have a recipe for traditional preserved lemons that take about eight weeks to ferment in the fridge. And you can find that on our website. So here are some preserved lemons that are ready to go. And we only need two tablespoons of these chopped up that we're gonna add to the pot. A little goes a long way with these guys. Just gonna chop these up nice and fine. Yeah, that looks like two tablespoons. Might be a bit heavy, but I like the flavor. Set that aside. Now let's work on the vegetables. There aren't a lot of vegetables going into this tagine. Just an onion, a bell pepper, and a carrot. So we're gonna cut these all the same way, lengthwise into nice strips. We're gonna start with the onion, cut it in half, and that's when I like to peel it. So I'm gonna slice off that root end, and now I'm just gonna slice all the way around, pole to pole, but I'm gonna angle the knife as I go. Now when I get about halfway, I like to tip that onion back on its other side, it's just easier. That's an onion. On to the bell pepper. Now, to do the bell pepper, I'm gonna cut off the top and the bottom, save those, we're gonna use them. Slice down through one side, and then open it up. And that's when you can easily take out the core and all those seeds. Then we're gonna go in and trim away some of those ribs using a knife. Now this is when your fingers get in the way a little bit, so just be careful. All right, so now that I have these flat pieces of pepper, it's easy to cut them into nice thin strips. Now for the tops and the bottoms, I don't like wasting anything, so I'm just gonna slice them as well. Last but not least, one carrot, which we're also gonna slice thin. Of course, you have to peel it first. Put the carrot on a solid surface of board. It makes it really easy to peel really quickly. For the carrot, we're gonna cut it on the bias so the carrots have a nice elongated shape. And that's it. Last but not least, I have a third of a cup of green pitted olives. And it's these two ingredients, the green olives and the preserved lemon, that are the classic flavorings in any tagine. Here I have a third of a cup of pitted green olives. And if you can find picholine olives or serignola, those have amazing flavor. But really, any good looking green olive will work well. So now I'm just gonna cut these into quarters. All right, with all the veg prep done, time to focus on the star of the show, the cod. So here I have one and a half pounds of cod. Oh, look at this beauty. Now this is a beautiful filet. Not a lot of prep we have to do here. It's already boneless and skinless. We're just gonna cut it up into nice stew-sized pieces, about an inch and a half to two inches. Cut it lengthwise, and then cut it into nice big chunks. The only prep we need to do to this fish is to season it with a little salt. This is half a teaspoon of table salt. 
And that salt's gonna do two things. It's gonna season the fish, but it's also gonna help that fish stay moist during cooking. We just need to let this fish sit while we start. A really important part of this recipe, it's a spice paste known as a tremula that's gonna give the fish a lot of flavor. And the first ingredient is cilantro. You wanna go for about half a cup and we wanna use mostly the leaves and the tender stems. You don't want the thicker stems because you want this to be a pretty smooth paste. So I'm gonna add this cilantro right to the food processor. Next, I'm gonna add four garlic cloves, and these are the ones that are already peeled, which I really love. Now we're gonna add the spices, and these spices are what makes the tagine really have flavor. We're gonna add a teaspoon and a quarter of cumin, teaspoon and a quarter of paprika, last but not least, a little cayenne, just a quarter of a teaspoon. We're gonna put the lid on. We're gonna pulse this until it's finely chopped, about 12 pulses or so. Next in, want about a tablespoon and a half of fresh lemon juice. I like to squeeze it right into the food processor. Ooh, this is a good juicy lemon. Mm, looking good. Last ingredient is some extra virgin olive oil, just two tablespoons. And I'm not gonna add it to the food processor with the blade spinning, because that can make that oil taste a little bitter. Instead, I'm gonna take it off and just add it by hand. When you're all done, this is what the charmoula looks like. It's finely minced, glistening with the oil and the lemon juice, and it has a wonderful fragrant smell. All right, we're gonna set that aside. It is time to start cooking the tagine, and what I have here is a Dutch oven heating up over medium heat with a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil in it, and that oil is starting to shimmer, so it's a perfect time to add the vegetables. Add them to the pot, along with a little salt, just a quarter teaspoon of salt. We're just gonna let these cook for five minutes or so until they soften. Now the word tagine actually refers to two things. First, it is the cooking method where everything is cooked gently together in a pot so it all gets flavored at once. Second, it is the traditional cooking vessel. It has that iconic look with that big lid. And if you have one of those, by all means, you should substitute it for the Dutch oven. These vegetables are nicely softened and it's time to add some tomatoes. Now this is a 14 and a half ounce can of diced tomatoes and we're gonna add it with the juice. That juice is gonna add nice liquid to the sauce. In go the green olives. Last but not least, we're gonna add the preserved lemons. Now a lot of recipes have you add the lemons at the end for a fresh flavor, but because this cooks so quickly, we found it nice to add them to the pot. That way it allows their flavor to bloom and really permeate through the sauce. All right, so here's the fish. And now we're gonna add the tremula to it. We're gonna coat the fish with this nice flavorful paste. And you really wanna do this at the last minute because you don't want the paste to start to marinate the fish. You just want it to flavor the fish during cooking. All right, so we're just gonna put this cod on top of its bed of vegetables. You wanna put them in a single layer. You don't wanna stack the cod on top of one another. I'm gonna scrape out any of the tremula left in the bowl because we want all that flavor in the pot. All right, medium heat. We're gonna put the lid on. We're gonna let this cook for three to five minutes until it just starts to turn opaque and the juices come out and start to bubble around the edges. This fish has been cooking for about four minutes. Time to take a look under the lid. Oh, you can see all that liquid that's come out of the cod and it's making a lovely sauce with all that juice from the canned tomatoes. No reason to add any water or broth here. There's plenty of liquid in the fish. That looks perfect. So I'm gonna turn the heat off and I'm actually gonna let the fish finish cooking off the heat. And that is key to ensuring that the fish doesn't overcook and start to fall apart. And the way you know the fish is perfectly cooked is that it registers about 140 degrees on a thermometer. So this fish has been cooking off the heat for about four minutes. Again, we're looking for a temp of about 140. 140, good to go. Now you don't want this to sit around. You wanna be able to serve it pretty much as it finishes cooking. One last prep, a little bit of cilantro for the top. So there is a bowl with the rice waiting. Oh, nice big chunks of cod. And this juice is one of the best parts of the tagine. I like to drizzle it right over the top and let it soak down into the rice. All right, little bit of bright cilantro on top. It's that easy. Now for a taste. Oh, the cod. I love it that it holds together, but as soon as you put your fork to it, it starts to fall apart. Mmm. Has so much flavor. 
I'm gonna dive down into that rice now, pick up some vegetables. The carrots in this, some of the best carrots you'll ever have. Mm. Mm. So if you wanna make Moroccan fish tagine, remember three things. First, use some preserved lemons. You can make them or you can buy them. Second, be sure to make your own charmoula with lots of cilantro and a few spices. And last, cook the fish off the heat so it doesn't turn tough. From America's Test Kitchen at Home, a great recipe for Moroccan fish tagine. Spices are often the difference between good cooking and great cooking. Let's start with a definition. A spice is any plant that you dry and then you eat. So that includes the bark of an evergreen tree, cinnamon, rhizomes and roots like ginger or turmeric, it can be a flower like lavender or rose petals, berries, peppercorns, vanilla, even herbs that we dry, we call spices. Enough with the botany, now let's start talking about some cooking. So really good tip. The most important thing is that your spices need to be fresh. One or two years out, and they begin to lose a lot of flavor. So you can try to guess. I have 63 spices. Yeah, I counted them in my cabinet. Or you can do what I do and put a date on them. So it's very simple. When you get it home, put a sticker on and the date so that you know how old that spice is. Do not use a spice rack on your counter next to the stove with a sunny window. Spices do not like heat and light. They belong in a dark cupboard. You can put them in the freezer if you want, but they're fine in the cupboard. Now, if you do not date them, or you have any doubts, I've got some tests for you. So we're gonna call this the sniff test and the crumble test. So the sniff test, I'm gonna use for a ground spice like ginger. And it's kind of exactly what you think it's gonna be. I'm gonna stick my nose in and take a really big whiff. And if you get nothing, actually, that was kind of a lot, um, so this is nice and fresh. You kind of want to get a lot, but if you get no aroma, you're going to get no flavor and you should start over. Now for something that you feel like doesn't quite sniff, there's not much here. So I'm going to do the crumble test. I'm going to put some in my hand and then I'm just going to basically crumble it with my fingers and see if I can release any flavor. I would say there's a little bit of flavor. Um, date on this is actually from 2019. So it's kind of old oregano. It's not bad, it's not gonna ruin my food, but the whole point of the spices are to elevate your food and that's not gonna happen. Next up, ground versus whole. We use a lot of ground spices in the test kitchen. I use a lot of ground spices at home. They're super convenient, but there are times when you want whole spices. Now, if you're gonna have whole spices, you're going to need a spice grinder. You know, you're thinking this is a coffee grinder. And yeah, it's a coffee grinder that I dedicate to spices. I actually have two of these, one for coffee and one for spices. Um, this is mine. I've had this at least 15, maybe 20 years. The biggest thing is to just take care of it by cleaning it. A damp paper towel will do the trick. And if it gets really dirty, and I'll show you, mm, that's not the cleanest I've ever had it. You can do a cleaning trick with rice. This is brown rice. You can use white rice, any rice you have. This is basically an abrasive. When you throw that raw rice, this is obviously uncooked rice, into the mill, and now I'm gonna turn it on, making a cocktail here. I'm shaking, actually trying to get the grain underneath the blade. All right, let's see. All right, and the rice has gotten underneath the blades and gotten out a fair amount of the gunk. That looks better. One last tip. There are gonna be times that you're using whole spices that you don't want them ground, but you want them cracked, say like, black pepper for steak au poivre, or cardamom that's gonna go into some oil to begin a curry recipe. So what best way to do this is with a plastic bag, because otherwise they're gonna fly all over your kitchen, and a heavy implement. You can use a meat pounder, or in this case, I've got a skillet, and just have some fun. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. You don't wanna go too far. Actually, I'm probably in danger of ripping this poor bag. Um, but get a lot of pressure on it, and you can see I'm beginning to crack this. So, spices, they're a workout, but they're gonna make your food taste so much better. Enjoy. So you wanna know how to clean a baking stone? Well, I'm gonna show you here with mine. You don't, you don't clean it. It should look like this. Breads, pizzas, rolls, baguettes have been baked on this stone 
for decades. I've had this longer than I've had my husband. And all these marks on there, they are marks of pride. So if your baking stone looks like this, you're doing something right. I've always eaten a lot of hummus, but this recipe I'm about to make is next level hummus. It's really the best hummus that I've ever had, really and truly. It starts with canned chickpeas. I'm starting with two cans here, and I'm just going to give them a good rinse. There's no shame in using canned chickpeas at all for this. We tasted dried chickpeas as well, and the canned were just as good, and they're a whole lot faster. We want them to get even softer. This is going to help make a super silky hummus. So we're going to cook them a little bit more. I have six cups of water, and I'm also adding a half a teaspoon of baking soda. The baking soda is going to raise the pH of the water, and it's going to help all of those chickpea skins come off. And then we're going to get rid of those skins. And I'll put this on the stove. I'm going to bring this up to a boil, then I'll lower it to a simmer. We want to cook this for about 20 minutes, and then the chickpea skins will start floating at the top of the water, and the beans will be nice and soft. While these simmer, let's start with the other ingredients. So I have four cloves of garlic that I'm going to mince up here. I'm going to measure out one tablespoon of garlic, and we're going to soak that garlic in some fresh lemon juice. And the lemon juice will help to temper the bite of the garlic. It deactivates an enzyme in the garlic called alanase, and it takes away that really harsh flavor without killing all of the garlic's personality. So I need a third of a cup of lemon juice. We're going to add the lemon juice and a teaspoon of salt. And we'll give that a stir. We'll let this sit for 10 minutes. We'll let the lemon juice work its magic on the garlic. And then the beans will be just about done in that time, too. All right, it's been 10 minutes, and the lemon juice has taken the harsh bite out of the garlic, so we'll just strain it away here. And this is nice, too, because we're not going to have any little bits of garlic in our hummus. It's going to be silky, luxuriously smooth, with nothing in there to take away from that. Okay, I think my chickpeas are ready now, and let's see how they look. You can see a lot of the skins have started to come off already, which is exactly what we want. And you can see the chickpeas have started to break down a little bit too, so that's perfect. So I'm gonna strain these. Now we'll put these back into the pot. Now I'm just gonna run some cold water on the chickpeas. This is going to cool them down and the skins are gonna start to float to the top. And I'm just gonna put my hand in, it's cool enough. I'm just gonna give them a little swish. All the skins start floating up to the top. So I'm just gonna pour those skins off, leave the chickpeas themselves behind, but try and get the skins off. See how many came off already? Okay, and then I'll do another swish. So we're gonna do this three or four times. You don't need to get every last chickpea skin. You wanna get about three quarters of a cup of them, and that'll go a long way toward giving you a nice silky hummus. Okay, perfect. So all those skins, I'm just gonna dump in the sink for now. We don't need them. Say goodbye to those. I want to save a couple nice whole chickpeas for the garnish, so I'm going to pick out two tablespoons. Okay, so time to make the hummus. Let's put the chickpeas into the food processor. And here is that garlicky lemon juice that we made earlier. I'm also adding a quarter cup of water, which is a really common addition to hummus. It helps loosen it up a little bit. And a quarter teaspoon of cumin. Not too much. We just want the cumin to be really subtle in the background there. All right, I'm going to whiz this up for about one minute. All right, that's been about a minute. Let's take a look. It's getting there. Ooh, smells good already. Okay, so now I'm going to add a half a cup of tahini. And tahini is a really important flavoring in hummus. So you want to make sure to look for one with a light color. That means that the sesame seeds have been lightly roasted. If you see a tahini that's dark in color, that means that it's been heavily roasted. And those tahinis tend to have a bitterness to them. So we definitely prefer a lighter color. And then I'm also adding two tablespoons of olive oil. Now, not all recipes call for olive oil in the hummus, but we found that it really helped give us that really super silky, luxurious texture that we wanted. Now, I'm adding the tahini after all of the other ingredients. And the reason I'm doing that is because the proteins in the tahini tend to absorb a lot of water. So by mixing the water with the other ingredients, it makes it harder for those proteins to attach to water. So the hummus won't thicken up and get too sticky and clumpy. Okay, so I'm going to let this go for another minute. 
All right, I think it's done. So you can see that's pretty loose. That might be different than the stuff you're used to buying in a tub at the supermarket, but that's what we want. If your hummus is too thick at this point, you can add one tablespoon of water at a time to thin it out a little bit. Okay, the hummus is done. So before we eat, I'm just gonna prepare some goodies to go with it. I have a couple of carrots and I like to cut them on the bias into nice long pieces. So you can eat your hummus with whatever you want. You can have it just with pita, which is great. I like to put a lot of veggies out too. I like to choose a lot of different colors. Next up, I'm going to do some radishes and I like to slice them in half like this and I like to leave the little tops on because they look pretty that way. And now I have some Persian cucumbers. They're nice and crisp. So I just like to slice these in half just like that because they just look gorgeous. Okay, and then I have to have pita with my hummus and I like the nice thick pita bread like this. And I'm just gonna cut some nice wedges. That's ready, now let's put our hummus on the platter. You can see that silkiness. See how it just flows? That's how hummus should be. Okay, then I just like to take the back of a spoon and smooth it out a little bit. It helps it look pretty. Okay. Now remember those chickpeas that we saved? I'm just gonna put a couple of whole chickpeas on top for a nice little garnish. Just a tiny little bit of cumin. Ooh, it's raining cumin. Okay, same thing. I have a tablespoon of parsley. And I'm just gonna give hummus a little sprinkle of parsley. And now just a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil just to finish it off. Ooh. I'm just doing a simple garnish today, but we have two other toppings, a spiced beef topping and a spiced walnut topping. They're both delicious and you can find the recipes on our website. Okay, it's time to try my amazing hummus. I'm gonna put some on a plate here. And the hummus is still a little bit warm at this point and that's the best way to eat it. So don't think you need to chill it down. It's delicious when it's still a little warm from the pot. So I'm gonna try it with a cucumber. Mmm. Mmm, that is amazing, it's perfect. The garlic is very subtle, but it's there. Tiny bit of cumin and that texture. Oh, this is really all I need for lunch, I'm good. I really hope you'll try this recipe. If you do, remember to add baking soda to the cooking water. Soak the garlic in lemon juice and use a light colored tahini. So from America's Test Kitchen at home, our best recipe for ultra creamy hummus. We have some pita this time. Thanks for watching. You can get all of the recipes from this season along with our product reviews and more at our website, americastestkitchen.com slash TV. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.